my proud honour to present um, Damien Rishnick, who's going to be talking about outsmarting smart contracts and essential walkthrough on blockchain minefield. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm going to talk about the blockchain uh, technology that is quite new, but as you can see, we have like 50, more than 50 years of experience in doing blockchain. So, <laughs> yeah, we are experts. But when you uh, surf on the internet, you'll see that blockchain is everywhere. Even today, I noticed that there is a conference about ICOs, which are strictly connected to blockchain, on the first and ground floor. So it's like everywhere. And when you go to the websites, you'll read that they are secure, like they are even cryptographically secure. But on the other hand, from time to time, and it's actually quite often, we see the articles saying that millions of dollars were, of course in crypto, were uh, frozen, burned, or just stolen. So my name is Damian Rusinek. Uh, I'm an uh, assistant professor at uh, Maria Curie Skłodowska University and also pen tester and researcher at Securing. And I'll try to answer the question, how come blockchains and smart contracts have such serious security flaws when they are so highly secured, cryptographically secured? And I'll show you how I was able to steal crypto from one of exchanges. So who's been using or maybe implementing blockchain? Yeah, there are well, quite a lot still. Uh, so the basics, what, what's blockchain? Actually, blockchain is like your dude. It's just distributed, unmodifiable database engine. And actually, that's the simplest explanation. It's like storage, which is uh, uh, unmodifiable. And if you wonder if you need blockchain, if you're looking for an investor, you probably uh, do. But uh, really, you probably don't. And if you really want to check the focus on the benefits of the blockchain and really want to check whether you need it, you must answer three questions. The first one is, can you have a single point of failure? Of course, nobody can have a single point of failure, but it doesn't mean you need blockchain already. You can just uh, use mirror, uh, mirrored servers and, uh, I don't know, Cloudflare uh, load balancers and so on. So the second question is, can you have a single point of authority? Which means, can, uh, can my whole project be uh, controlled by one institution or, right, uh, or one person? If no, then you probably need blockchain. And the second question, can I have modifiable data? And I mean the history data. It, it means like whatever goes to blockchain stays in blockchain. You cannot modify it. If you need that uh, attribute, then you probably need blockchain. And by the analogy to Tor network, uh, Blockchain is really very similar because it's also the network of nodes that you cannot control. But the difference is that Tor network gives you the communication which is anonymous, private, and blockchain gives you a storage which is unmodifiable. And the most common uh, application of blockchain is Bitcoin, which uses uh, blockchain to store the transactions, to store its ledger. Who knows what's Bitcoin? Yeah, everybody knows. Who has Bitcoin? Okay, so but I'm, I'm interested not in the Bitcoin because it's the first generation of blockchain. I'm interested in smart contracts, the second generation of blockchain. And smart contracts are like simply programs that are kept and run on blockchain. And again, by the analogy to the executable file, to get executable file to run it, you have to first uh, code it, I mean uh, program it, then compile it to any executable file, and then you store it on your computer, on your server, and later you can execute it. Smart contracts are very similar at the beginning. You also have to uh, write them, write the code, then you have to compile it to some kind of uh, uh, virtual machine bytecode, and the difference is that you don't store it on one computer, you store it in blockchain, and you execute it in blockchain. So you don't control where uh, the servers that store your, com your program. And I have used Ethereum platform as an example because it's the biggest smart contracts platform. Actually, it's the second uh, cryptocurrency after Bitcoin. So with the capitalization, well, this changes a lot. Uh, I did that uh, screenshot a few days ago and I'm sure that those numbers are not very uh, accurate uh, at the moment. But still, it shows just, it's like uh, billions of dollars, like about 50 billions of dollars. So quite a lot. And 
why would we use smart contracts? Why, why would we keep our and execute our programs not on our servers but in the blockchain? Because there is no single point of the authority, so nobody can uh, accuse us of executing, it, executing the program uh, in some in improper way, like maliciously. So there is no trust, uh, it's trustless. There, you don't need a trusted third party. It just executes itself, it's like magic. And if you use public blockchains, you can easily verify the execution of your program, uh, of uh, others programs that you execute. So it's, uh, it all just allows public verification. And how do you think, what kind of programs could we use on smart contracts? Gambling, yeah. You don't need trusted third party. That's good, gambling. And political ones. Voting, voting exactly. Imagine that you could run voting presidential elections for, I don't know, let's say US, that anyone, including all of you, can control. And no one can tam tamper the data. That's nice, right? Actually, nobody does it, of course. Yeah, no, I mean the governments, but still. And any kind of assets management, like transferring ownership of uh, households, cars, whatever. And I'm gonna use e-voting as an example. So I, I, wanna, I wanna create a smart contract that uh, uh, conducts e-voting. And when I do it, it's published in the blockchain. And I'd like to check it, whether it's published correctly. Maybe somebody tried to tamper the, the code. So I can use uh, dedicated uh, websites like Etherscan.io to view the blockchain. As I told you before, you can just uh, easily public, it's all public so we can uh, check it. And you can, of course, uh, ask blockchain directly to get some data. But Etherscan and websites like Etherscan are very uh, usable. So you go to the address of your program because whenever you publish a smart contract, you get a unique address and check the bytecode. And you can just verify whether it's the same bytecode that you compiled on your computer before uh, publishing the smart contract. Okay, so now we'd like to execute the smart contract. If it's you voting, I'd like to vote. And of course, smart contract is a program, so it has its code. And one of the functions in the code is the vote function. Uh, the vote function gets one parameter proposal, so you, the candidate that you'd like to vote for. And if you want to uh, execute vote function on any particular uh, contract, you must create some kind of transaction. And in this transaction, you must specify wh what kind of function you want, which function you want to execute, and it's done by the hashing the header of function and taking the first four bytes, it's the red here, and you specify all arguments. There's one argument here in the red, he's that long, he's zero, actually, and he's that long because that's the size of uint type. And then you put this data into the transaction, you specify to which contract you want to send this transaction, and you just, of course, sign it and send to the blockchain. And the blockchain and the Ethereum platform executes your function and stores the current state of all contracts. And if you want to verify the execution, of course, you would like, right? Especially when we are talking about uh, e-voting. You can just view not only the, the smart contracts, but you can also view the transactions, which um, mean that you can view the execution of, your, of the contract. So here's an example of uh, uh, one transaction which executes vote, actually I have it bigger, vote function with one argument uh, zero. So we have verified, yes, it was, uh, the vote function was executed and the uh, argument is zero. Great. So if we know, well, now when we know how it works, let's uh, go into the security of uh, the smart contracts and I'll show you three minds that you, can, that you must uh, be uh, considering when, when doing uh, smart contracts. First mind is that all your data is public. Of course, I'm talking about public blockchains, but most of uh, smart contract platforms are public, like Ethereum, uh, EOS, and so on. So, what data is kept in smart contracts? Variables, right? So you have to store the state of the contract. 
And here's an example of, again, this is the smart contract for revoting, and there is a, a variable voters, which is set as public. What's the consequence? You can go again to etherscan IO and just check uh, value of, vo uh, of voters variable uh, for particular address. So you can s uh, check here who has voted for whom, okay? And we'd like to hide it, right? So we don't want to show. Usually that's one of the attributes of voting that you cannot view who has voted for whom. So let's change the visibility specifier to private. Yes, we won. There is no voters variable on the eater scan. Great. But still, I can check all transactions that were sent to this contract and uh, view the, the sender of the transaction, the method that they used, which is vote uh, in my case, and the argument that they specified. So from, not from, uh, directly from smart contract, but from the transactions sent to the smart contract, I can see who has voted for whom. So even if you... Uh, specify the um, variable as private, it doesn't mean that it's really private. It's still public. And the same is with functions. Functions can also be private. And here is a, one a private function. Uh, private functions can be called only inside the smart contract. So from other function in the same smart contract. Uh, public functions uh, on the other side can be executed by anyone. So you can execute any public function on any smart contract. And the question is, how do you think? Can we execute the malicious function number two? It has no uh, visibility type specified. It's not specified whether it's public and whether it's, or is it private. How do you think? Public. Yeah, exactly. Functions are public by default. So if you don't specify the visibility type, it's default, so anyone can execute it. And that was the case of the uh, Parity Wallet breach. Parity Wallet is a smart contract which is a wallet for your cryptocurrency. And the problem was that there was a function init wallet which was public, so anyone could execute init wallet function. And what does it mean? It means that anyone can take over your wallet. And when they do, they just transfer money from your wallet to their secure wallet or personal address, which is not smart contract. So the uh, interesting fact about this attack was that there was a race, because blockchain is unmodifiable, so you cannot patch easily the uh, contract. So they had the, the thieves, the black hats, tried to steal as much money as they could, and there was a group of white hats who uh, also tried to steal as much as they could, but to give it back later to the owners. And uh, uh, Black Hats managed to steal about th uh, 30 millions of dollars, and uh, White Hats saved like 80 millions of dollars. And by the way, that's the uh, value at the time of attack. Today it would be like about 90 million and 240 million, respectively. So the lessons learned from the mine number one is that you should set visibility to all functions so that you don't forget about one which is critical, unfortunately. <laughs> And do not keep secret data as plain texts in uh, smart contracts. Use blind commitments instead. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Uh, but because other examples. Who knows the uh, rock, paper, scissors game? Yeah, I'm sure everyone. So how can you win? How can uh, you always win? You just wait for your opponent to send his option. For example, he sends rock. You view it in the transaction. And then you set paper. I win. Okay, that's that easy. So uh, how to mitigate this? Use blind commitments. And the idea here is that you divide your smart contract into two phases. In the first phase, you send uh, the participants, send hash of the real value. So they don't uh, show the real value that they want to send. And when the first phase is finished, everyone says the real value, but no one can send the hash anymore. And the contract checks whether the uh, value corresponds to the hash, matches the hash, and then finds out the, uh, the winner, for example, in rock, paper, scissors game. Mind number two, smart contract is a program. That's what I said many times before, but it's program, so it has vulnerabilities known from, for typical programs. And an example, integer overflow. 
Uh, let's use Ethereum token as an example for smart contract. Ethereum token is like your own cryptocurrency. You can just create a smart contract that specifies I have one million tokens and I can transfer it to anyone. And then you can sell it, give it, or whatever. And you, actually you can create your personal token which uh, specifies uh, like the value of your name, for example. You can accept it as payment for your services. Like uh, imagine popular people, like, I mean VIPs or celebrities with their uh, personal tokens. That's quite a nice idea. But let's get back to security. Uh, Ethereum token usually had that transfer function. So this function gives you the opportunity to give somebody else the uh, tokens. So you specify where to send the uh, token and how much. So it's two and value uh, parameters. And the idea here of the attack is that we would like to empty victim's uh, wallet. And we, have, we need some assumptions. So one assumption is that uh, a victim has uh, very many tokens, like the maximum number, the minus one, uh, sorry, minus nine in this example. So that's the biggest number that can be kept in the particular uh, type, minus nine, okay? And attacker has only 10 tokens. So what does attacker do? He just sends 10 tokens to the victim. And thanks to this one beautiful line and integer overflow, when you add 10 tokens to the balance of the victim, he has zero tokens because it circled, the, the balance circles back to zero. So it's classic, uh, classic vulnerability that we all know from, uh, from the normal programs, let's say. And it's the same here. It can happen in smart contracts. The second thing, insecure libraries. Libraries in smart contracts are just contracts that are called by other contracts, like libraries we all know. So let's assume that there are a few contracts that call the same. And here we have, all, again, the parity wallet. Uh, the idea was to use a library because we only have to publish the uh, logic once and then call it. So whenever you uh, publish a new wallet, you publish uh, just a small amount of bytecodes because they call a library, which is huge. And uh, that's because storing data in blockchain in Ethereum is uh, very expensive. So that was, uh, they used a library to uh, mitigate, the to lower the cost. And the problem was here was that there was a library which was also a wallet. And that was the wallet uh, un in uh, not initialized by anyone. So it was like a wallet waiting to be initialized. And one guy, uh, some, some people think that they, he did it on purpose. Some people think that, and actually he thinks that it was a mistake, called init wallet. And you can see there is only an un, uh, uh, initialized modifier here, which means that only one, you can do it only once. But nobody did it before, so he could do it. And he became the owner of library. And what he did again? Again, by mistake. He called kill function, which removes the smart contract from blockchain, which means that there are very many wallets, smart contract wallets, that want to use library that does not exist anymore. So that's how million, uh, half a million of ethers, which is cryptocurrency for Ethereum, frozen. Frozen means that they are still there, but nobody can touch them. It's like throwing away a hard drive with bitcoins uh, to the lake, for example, right? They are still there, but you cannot take them. So lessons learned from mine number two. You should use open libraries to handle typical errors. And there are f nice libraries like uh, safe math for overflows. And of course, you should write tests for boundary conditions and verify the correctness and test the libraries that you plan to use. Don't assume that if something is published in blockchain, it's safe. Mine number three. Smart contracts have limitations, so specific limitations for, for Ethereum, for example. And one of the most known is a gas limit. Uh, the idea here is that all transactions are given some gas. And when you execute uh, all operations, all opcodes actually, one by one, the gas goes down because all operations cost some gas. And when the gas goes to zero, 
and the transaction is not finished, it's rejected. Okay, so you must give enough gas to drive from A to B, right? To execute the whole transaction. And uh, the gas is just ether, so you actually pay to execute the function. And the idea of gas is to uh, prevent infinite loops. So to prevent the DOS attacks on the whole platform. Because you could, exec you could publish, and actually you can publish, a, a smart contract with infinite loop. And then if you could run uh, this loop infinitely, the Ethereum platform would hang, right? Classic DOS. So uh, that was the idea, right? Let's use gas limit, and if it goes to zero, just finish execution and reject the transaction. But here we can also use this limitation to perform the OS attack. And the idea is the following. Let's assume that we have a, a smart contract for auction. Auction that uh, tries to sell a very popular painting, and the initial price is zero. So there is a Bob who wants to buy it for one eater, and he uses a, 100 units of gas, okay? That's his limit. Okay, that's fine. He, uh, he's, he ha he's the highest bidder at the moment, and the, now the price of the uh, painting is one eater. But Alicia, uh, Alice, uh, Alice comes in, and she wants to buy it for two eaters, and she also sends 100 uh, units of gas. So what auction contract has to do, it must send back one eater to Bob, and he use, uh, so he creates a transaction to send back uh, one eater, and there is hard-coded 50 units of gas uh, for this transaction. It's hard-coded. And that's perfectly fine, because that's enough to send money to personal address of Bob. Okay, so Alice becomes now the highest bidder, the price is two eater. Now there is an attacker, and attacker knows one fact, that sending Man, uh, sending ether to contract costs more. So what, uh, what attacker does? He creates a contract, his own contract, that forwards his bid. And he sends three ethers with 100 units of gas through his contract to the auction contract. And now, auction contract sends back two ethers to uh, Alice, and winner's contract is now the highest bidder, not the winner himself. But Bob really wants to buy this painting. So he says, I want to pay four eater, which is like $2,000 at the moment. So it's not that expensive painting. Uh, and again, he sends 100 units of gas. But the problem is that when con uh, auction contract wants to send back three eaters to the contract of attacker, 50 units of gas, which, are, which is hard coded, is not enough because sending uh, eaters to contract costs more. And if it's not enough, it's rejected. And Bob's, uh, Bob's transaction is also rejected. So from now on, winner just have to wait because further bids are blocked. So, uh, sorry, attacker. Actually, he's the winner as well. So he's the winner, he just have to wait until the auction is finished. And if he jumps in very quickly, he can buy it for the painting like for one eater if he, he was the first one. So lessons learned from mine number three, uh, we should learn the limitations of Ethereum. And gas is only one of them. There is also randomness, which is really hard to achieve in uh, Ethereum because every operation must be executed exactly the same on each node in the network. So uh, you, you cannot do like pseudo randomness locally. And uh, we should learn the way to handle these limitations and, of course, write tests for, uh, to check how we handle these limitations. And if you want to test your smart contracts, there are nice tools, uh, online tools like Remix, Securify, and SmartCheck. Also, uh, offline tools uh, like Solhint, Oyenta, and Miftrill. And there are also nice practices uh, created by consensus. And there is DASP, which is nice because it's like OVASP top 10 for smart contracts. So it's really worth seeing. But smart contracts themselves are not only the uh, vulnerable. There is also integration between, uh, from some uh, applications to smart contracts. And let's leave the smart contracts themselves the, uh, for now. We now would like to attack some kind of 
application that uses uh, smart contracts. And these applications can be like online wallets, uh, crypto exchanges, of course, uh, games, gambling uh, websites, and ICOS. ICOS is uh, like, like Kickstarter on uh, crypto. They, you just, it's like crowdfunding, like selling your, uh, your startup with uh, tokens. Uh, and the idea here is that we don't want to attack the smart contract itself. We want to attack the web, uh, web application that, uh, to create uh, some kind of malicious transaction. Transaction which is perfectly fine from the perspective of Ethereum, but is malicious from the perspective of the web application. And let's steal some tokens from the exchange. When you withdraw some money from the exchange, uh, I mean the tokens, the crypto tokens, Ethereum tokens, uh, the exchange creates a transaction, transaction transfer, which uh, transfer the, uh, the tokens that you want to your address. So there are, two, uh, there are two parameters, address parameter and value parameter, and of course there's a function. And the uh, interesting fact is that you control the address parameter and you control the value parameter. So, uh, when withdrawing tokens from the exchange. So let's see what happens on Ethereum when you use too short address, okay? So sh the address should have uh, uh, 20 bytes and there, are, there is, it's padded with 12 uh, zero bytes so that it's 32 bytes, uh, the, the parameter. So let's use too short address. And uh, Ethereum doesn't know whether you send a too short address, right? It has a list uh, of bytes, a stream of bytes, and he knows that the first four bytes is the function, and if it's transfer function, the next 32 bytes is address. So it's gonna take the next 32 bytes, and it's modified address. It will take some bytes from the value parameter, okay? So now, the value is too short, okay? The, the second parameter is too short. And how do you think? What does Ethereum do with too short input data? What would you do? You have a transaction that has too short data. Who would accept that? Who would reject that transaction? Yeah, almost everybody would reject that, but not Ethereum. Ethereum pads this with zeros. So actually what it does, it shifts the value. So here is an example of a uh, of a transaction which was uh, a mistake, uh, but very nice mistake. Uh, as you can see, the address is too short. It should have the same length as value. So you can see it's too short. What uh, Ethereum did, it took the padded address, but the, uh, the zeros from uh, value parameter were taken to the address, so it's padded pad on, the, on the right, and shifted value. It added as many zeros at it, as it needed. So now, user tried to send 2,400, about 2,400 Golem tokens to the address that is, of course, not correct. It, it was his mistake, but he tried to send it to that short address. And what Ethereum understood is that he tried to send uh, 2 times 10 to 45 Golem tokens to the address with many zeros. And this transaction was rejected. But not, uh, but not because it was uh, uh, too short, but because there was no so many Golem tokens. And if there were so many Golem tokens, somebody would uh, uh, lose a lot, right? And Golem tokens is worth about uh, half a dollar at this moment. So that's a good amount of money, right? Okay, so what was my uh, idea to attack the exchange? Uh, I, try, I deposit one token on the exchange, then I generate an address with one zero byte at the end, and it's a matter of seconds, like 15 seconds. Then I want to withdraw this one token with, uh, with address that is modified, but I'm sending the address without last byte, okay? Without last zero byte, really. Okay, so I'm using, I'm using the address with uh, one uh, zero byte at the end, and then my value is uh, shifted, and how many tokens would I receive if I, want to tr uh, if I try to uh, withdraw one token? Sorry? 
256, because it's shifted eight bits, one byte, eight bits, okay? So <clears throat> let's try it. And of course here, application is very, uh, is perfectly okay with that, because I want to withdraw one token, and they, uh, it checks whether I have one token, so it's completely fine. So that's my uh, transaction, and uh, as you can see, the, the address is not that short, but it's shorter, uh, it's, it has no one zero byte at the end, and what Ethereum does, it took one zero byte from the value, okay? So it took those two hex zeros from the value, so I have, uh, that's my address, that's the address that I generated, so I can control it, and then, it, to, it added two uh, hex zeros at the end. So I deposited almost half a golem token and withdrew, withdrew approximately 120. So it's like 256 times more. Okay, so I have a vulnerability, great. I want, to, I want to report it, but to whom? The problem is that there is no information on the site, on the exchange site, about the owner, about somebody, a CEO or anyone. So I had to be a Sherlock and find the guy, and the time is running. You remember the race? 30 million versus 80 million? Of course, it's not that big, but still, somebody can use this vulnerability because everything is public and unmodifiable. So I stopped for a second and I, I thought, how can we do this, like, generally? How can we report uh, responsibly the vulnerability in smart contracts? So, how can we inform the owner of smart contract if we don't know him? So there are two options. You can either steal crypto and then look for the owner, or you can look for the owner and hope that nobody else steals the crypto. What would you do? Who would steal and look? Uh, who would steal and look? Who would look and hope? Yeah, I would steal and look, and that, that's what I did. But uh, that, that was the generation of this problem, right? So my idea was, why don't we send him an encrypted message, which is kept on Ethereum? It's encrypted that, uh, with his public key, so only, him can, uh, only he can decrypt it, and it's on Ethereum, which is unmodifiable blockchain, so I cannot withdraw this message. I cannot delete it. So it's like my... Uh, it, it proves that I'm ethical hacker, right? I am hacker, I'm stealing this money, but before I'm, selling, I'm saying that I want to steal this money and I'll give it back. And it will be on this address and here is the private key for this address, okay? And it's encrypted, only the owner of the contract can read it. And I've created a tool which I call the Responsible Disclosure Ethereum Messenger, which is online and on GitHub. And this tool is used to first send a secret message, and of course, decrypt this message. So here is a demo. I have a vulnerable contract. This is the vulnerable contract, and I don't know the owner. I copy the, the address of the contract. I'm using my tool, uh, pasting this uh, address here, and I need to find out what's the public key of the owner of this contract. So I need to find a transaction, and here is, I retrieve the public key automatically, and I'm sending him a message. Contact me ASAP or anything. I can send him uh, a private key of new, uh, of new address where I transferred the money that I uh, have stolen. Here is an encrypted message, and I also add the link so that he, you will see that later. He, can, he knows what to do with this message. And I'm an ethical hack hacker, I'm sending this. This is the MetaMask, uh, it's a plugin to uh, web browsers which allows you to send transactions. Here is the transaction that I sent. Of course, I have to wait until it's validated. And in Ethereum, you have to wait uh, approximately 10 seconds, while in blo Bitcoin, it would be like 10 minutes. So I'm waiting until this is uh, validated and added to the blockchain. Okay, it's been added, so I want to view it. And it will say that the operation failed, right? It's fail. So the execution failed, but I don't care. I don't want to execute the contract. I want to leave the message, which is encrypted. And I've added the link. If you think about phishing, I'll, I'll say something in a second. Uh, but I've added the link, 
Uh, and if somebody pastes the, uh, the, uh, the link in the browser, he would be redirected to my, uh, to my tool. And I'm, not, I'm not just changing that now I'm the contract owner because I received this message. And I'm just copying the uh, identifier of this message, of this transaction, to my tool. Yeah, in the second tab. I load the message and I'm contacting blockchain at this moment and I have to provide the private key. And the tricky fact is that I need the private key, but don't worry, it's, it's offline. Uh, you can just turn, on, uh, turn off your internet. This is a JavaScript application. You can download it and execute open in your web browser locally and view in, uh, that there is no communication with anything. Uh, so I take the private key and I have the message decrypted. So that, that's how it works. Just two simple use cases. So to sum up, we have two types of vulnerabilities. The, those that we all know from typical programs, like overflows, underflows, unauthorized access, uh, insecure libraries, or just business logic vulnerabilities. And those that are specific for smart contracts, like uh, those related to Ethereum limitations, re-entrancy, uh, which I didn't talk about, but you can read a lot on this DASP project. And there are, of course, many more. Well, to end up with some kind of top 10, like we love it in OVASP, my top 10 recommendations are the following. First, remember that all data is public. So remember that. Do not then do not keep secret data as plain text. Use blind commitments uh, instead. Then set visibility uh, type to all functions so that you don't forget about the critical one. Learn the limitations and how to handle them, like gas limit, re uh, randomness, and so on. Of course, write tests for handling limitations for boundary conditions. Uh, write many tests. And verify the libraries that you plan to use, so read it, uh, ch check whether there were no uh, attacks on these libraries. Uh, check if there is anyone, if anyone uses this library, actually, because there may be some uh, malicious libraries published on purpose, right? Like the honeypots or something. And uh, of course, use the best security practices, so you have to learn them. And I showed you that consensus page, where is very nice sum uh, summary of those best uh, practices. Uh, and consider threats from the apps that integrate with blockchain. You don't have to uh, always attack the smart contract themselves. You can attack the web application that integrates with it. And of course, test your contracts and blockchain applications. Like it sums up everything. And uh, if you if you are interested in uh, our general summary about how to develop uh, secure blockchain applications, I would recommend our article. Uh, which is available on our page. And if you have any questions, I, I don't know how many time I have. Two, three minutes. Two, three minutes, okay. So uh, if you have uh, any questions and uh, we'll have no time to ask them here, you just email me, leave me your card, I'll send you uh, my presentation. Uh, e PM me or Twitter or whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, that will be hard. <laughs> I've got two questions, possibly both repeated. But in your example with the uh, address field being the wrong length, would the system that was executing the contract not have figured out that you didn't have that much many tokens to withdraw? Well, yeah, of course, I've checked many ex exchanges, and I, have, uh, I found only one which is vulnerable. So most of them verify, the, validate the, uh, the correctness of the address. And uh, I was lucky just to find this one that I could talk to you about here. Uh, but yeah, the, there is also, uh, you of course have to do the validation on, in the web application. So you must know uh, the, the format of address, format of the value parameter in your web application and you have to validate it. So it's not like general and it doesn't mean that all uh, crypto exchanges are vulnerable. That's a very good question. And uh, before I answer that, I told you about the phishing, and I didn't, uh, I didn't say about that. 
Uh, after, one, uh, after one presentation of that, somebody told me that it's a very good place for phishing. Well, yes, but Git.io allows only to shorten links from GitHub. So I, I cannot uh, shorten any. And that's why I used Git.io, because I cannot short there any kind of link. And uh, uh, coming back to your question, it is hard, and I'm, I'm working on it now, uh, how to make sure that uh, this person gets the message. But you know, it's, if it's smart contract, and there's big money on that, and there is no big money uh, sometime, he will notice. Right? And my idea is not to, uh, to uh, alarm him that you may be vulnerable and someone can steal your money. My idea is that I want to send him a message saying that, don't worry, you, have no this, uh, you don't have this money anymore, but I know where it is and you, can, uh, you don't have to worry, you can take it, right? Without my bounty, okay? Uh, just kidding. Uh, and... Uh, and so I don't want you know, to make sure that he gets this message uh, as sub. And after some time, he will probably notice that there is no eaters on his, on his smart contracts. And then I, it's also like I can look for him then, and he cannot call me a thief when I find him. Because look, I sent you a message. It's encrypted, use your pri private key, and see that it's from my address and uh, I want it to be ethical, okay? I hope that answers the question. Okay, one quick, more, very quick question. Mm -hmm. Did you talk to a lawyer about stealing and informing afterwards? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should. <laughs> uh, actually, I found the guy behind that, uh, behind that uh, exchange, and they didn't have bounty, back bounty, but they started that. And I was the first guy who got a uh, bounty from them. And uh, so, well, that's, that's a good question. And actually, that's not a question. That's a recommendation that is very good. Uh, because it's not always like that. There are some exchanges that uh, don't have happy ending. Uh, and, uh, and in that case, I really should talk to a lawyer, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much, Damien. Thank you. Thank you.